First of all, uh, it's a great honour to be here today. Thank you to Steve and Vanessa and all the volunteers for asking me to come here. The Friar Library does hold uh, Thomas Shapcott's papers, uh, as, well as, um, as well as Tom's papers, also Judith's papers, and the papers of many other distinguished lit literary figures, David Maloof, Peter Carey, Ujiru Nunuckle. So um, that wonderful collection uh, speaks to this beautiful collection out here in Rosewood, because this project of founding a library, I think uh, it was um, Andrew Carnegie, the great American philanthropist, who said, if you build a community um, a, a library, it's the greatest gift you can, you can give them. And he said it's a never failing spring in the desert. And the last time I was here, it was uh, a bit drier and dustier. But now this wonderful lush grass outside in the garden is nothing better than a garden complementing a library. I think it's as Cicero said, all you need is a garden and a library and you've got everything you need. So it's a great pleasure to be here. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we gather, pay my respects to the, um, the elders, uh, keepers of law and sacred story. It's a great honour, Tom, to be in your presence again today. It's been five years since you came to visit us at the Friar Library and we were able to get out for you portraits in the collection that have been painted over the years of you. Uh, and I, I had a, a Facebook memory come up just uh, the other day of that and it was five years ago. I can't believe how quickly the time, the, the time has flown. Uh, I've just brought a couple of uh, books and something to show uh, show you, but I just wanted to, a couple of years ago, we, or ten years ago now, we brought out a treasures book called Found in Friar. There was an entry in that on, on the Tom Shapcott papers and Carol Hetherington, who's a lovely scholar, a friend of mine, she put together this entry. I'll just read a little bit about that. It says, uh, Tom Shapcott's remarkably varied career is clearly reflected in his collection in the Friar comprises material from the earliest years of his career and includes not only manuscript drafts for poems, stories, novels, music and choral work, but also material that illuminates his work as an editor, anthologist, arts, and arts administrator. Shapcott is notably a Queensland writer, but he's not merely parochial or regional. Much of his work is permeated with images of Queensland, the luxuriant subtropical backyards of suburban Brisbane in Hotel Bellevue. Actually, um, Years ago at the State Library, we had uh, an event for the year of the built environment and uh, we were talking about the nature of Queensland houses and we had a presentation in the auditorium and I was reading a book about the Queensland house and there's a quote from Hotel Bellevue um, about what it was like when you used to have to leave the house in the middle of the night to go out to the outback dunny. <laughs> so it was a nice passage and it, it kind of, um, and also it spoke about how the houses had a character and they were sort of alive in the way they creak and move. And at that time I realised it's in creative literature that you can get into a topic like architecture, you know, such as David Maloof's 12 Edmonston Street, where you get a sense of what those dwellings were like, you get a real sense of things. Um, so I studied literature at UQ uh, back in the 90s, and in fact the uh, first time I went to the Friar Library was for a research method subject, and Chris Tiffin, who was a lecturer there at the time, used as the example the Thomas Shapcott papers. Uh, so my first time in the Friar Library was looking at Tom Shapcott's papers and then subsequently I've come to be the Friar Librarian so I have the great privilege of being able to look through the papers at my leisure or, or the other night or other late afternoon I was uh, up in the repositories on level seven and there I'm in the row with Judith Rodriguez's books on one side and Tom Shapcott's on the other and all these other great writers. And I noticed how many books Tom had written and Judith was also very prolific and I spent some time just um, looking in those books looking for a poem that would speak to me but I thought just before I get to that I would uh, just one thing I've brought with me today that's a very special thing uh, and this is what this entry is about in our Found in Friar book. Um, it says here, this is uh, Carol's words again, Shapcott's connections with Europe began early uh, the Ipswich of his youth was notably multicultural. He recalls almost every other name at my school was German sounding and his best friend at school still spoke Danish uh, at home. His continuing engagement with European cultures is apparent in novels such as The White Stag of Exile and Search for Galena and his anthology of contemporary Australian poetry produced in Macedonia. In 1989 he received one of Europe's most prestigious poetry prizes. The Golden Wreath is awarded annually in its 40, uh, in its 44 year history, only six, or well, 44 years back in 2010, only six other English language poets have received the award including W.H. Auden, Ted Hughes and Seamus Heaney. Shapcott was the, the third. So I brought the award with me today just to show you, show you all.
Now, this part of the text I might not be able to read properly because I've got my reading glasses, but this is a quote from Tom about this award. Uh, it was a huge boost for me, though I had previously had some contact. Sorry. My novel, uh, White Stag of Exile, had been translated and published in Macedonia, and I had produced an anthology of modern Australian poetry for the Struga Festival in 1987, which had been wonderfully successful there, demonstrating the liveliness of our poetry, which, has a, uh, which was a revelation to them. So it was not uh, really unexpected, but nonetheless a surprise. Um, when I went over to receive the award, I was rather amazed at how popular poetry was over there. I was treated like a tennis star mm -hmm. is treated here. The Serbian weekend paper had me on the cover of their, um, something, their section. I was, uh, it was pointed out, I was pointed out, pointed to on the street, Belgrade, but not, not Struga. Uh, and I, um, I read to an audience of over 20,000 people, very big over there. And that, that just, uh, I was looking for that poem that would speak to me. And um, just a couple of weeks ago, my, my grandson's, uh, sorry, my, my son's grandfather in Serbia passed away. He was a, quite a distinguished journalist over there named Milos Vasic. Uh, the, there's an obituary for him in the recent Guardian. Uh, he covered all of the, the war and the Balkans and um, the time of Milosevic and so on. He passed away in Belgrade um, two weeks ago. And when I was looking through all of these books up in our stacks, I, this one spoke to me, and it's called uh, Belgrade Autumn. There's a fog, noon, mid-afternoon. Fog listens and is precise. The city is blanked out under coal smell, damp smell, urine. There are trees in avenues that have, have a weak to jettison foliage. One can believe the chimney of every factory has a part in this but it's nothing to what seasons themselves impose. If I were to walk outside, there would be people, stalls, and grilled corn cobs, shoeshine men with coloured laces displayed in clusters like drying tobacco, newsstands, supermarkets, department stores in old buildings like Ipswich. The fog leaps back 30 years, and I'm a boy jumping across roadworks, not noticing the old soak begging illegally, cadging still an ordinary habit. Now I'm 50, the boy does not have to accept the humiliations of depression. He is tearing, tearing ahead into a future built on credit. In Cyrillic script, even familiar names here are a conscious act I must translate. I restructure each letter and my prize is held in a word, at most in a phrase. The sentence here evades me, closes in again, leaves me, scuffling like a teenager among any, anyone's debris. And that poem, I guess, spoke to me because of the reference to Serbia, but also um, I've turned 50 this year, so it's a, a poem. And also the year it was written, 1995, was a very special year for me, the first year I went overseas. Uh, so, Tom, it's uh, wonderful to be uh, here with you today and with everybody. Uh, it's a great honour, and um, I've loved spending time with your collections at the state, at the, at the Friar Library. And now that this place has been built here, which I just absolutely love, I think, to build a library in the community uh, like Rosewood and to have this here, it's just so very special. So I'd, I'd like everyone to give a round of applause to Steve and to Vanessa for what they've done here. Uh, moving on to Judith, Judith Rodriguez, Tom's uh, long-time uh, partner. Uh, Judith had a very strong connection to UQ. Uh, she was a student there and um, she was a student under Doc Robbie who founded the Friar Library. And her first uh, book, book of poetry published by UQP is called New Plastic Fanfare Red. I think there's a copy in the display case, which incidentally is a beautiful display case that the guys have put together uh, for this, some of this material. And that collection was dedicated, it says, to the memory of Mer M Miss Mary Alexis McMillan and Dr F.W. Robinson who taught me. Uh, Mary Alexis McMillan was the fiancé of Jack Fryer, for whom the Fryer Library is named, and he died in 1923 of war-related injuries. He'd, been, he'd suffered poison gas and so on, but it was ultimately tuberculosis that took his life. And in that same year, Doc Robbie became a lecturer at UQ, and he started teaching Australian literature. So Judith um, had a very strong connection to UQ. In fact, uh, she said that even going to Cambridge, UQ was still, uh, when she was Judith Green, a very special place for her. And uh, when she passed away, I know that uh, she had uh, already made contact with Steve and she'd heard about the, the, the library here and she was very supportive of it. 
Um, I was in touch with Zoe, and David Maloof actually said, oh, <coughs> Zoe, uh, contact Simon at the Friar Library, take the papers in, but the, the library, the books, will go to the Australian Cultural Library here. So both Tom's library and Judith's library are here. All those amazing inscriptions, uh, all of those, you know, the, the provenance of those things are really fascinating, the connections with other students who wrote books, and that creative resource is here. I remember years ago, uh, I read an, an essay by Italo Calvino, the, the Italian writer, and he gave a series of lectures on literature. One was about exactitude, and he was talking about reading Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks. And in the notebooks, there was this passage that he'd scrubbed out again and again. He was looking for the right words, and he, he was, he'd observed some fossilised bones in the side of a mountain of like an antediluvian sea creature, like a, like a prehistoric um, uh, dinosaur. And he kept scratching out the sentence. He's trying to imagine what the dorsal fin would have looked like furrowing through the seawater. And finally, he came up in Italian with con grave superbandamento, which means with su such stately and grave bearing. So what Italo Calvino was pointing to was that the writer crafts these words until he gets the right or she gets the right combination of words. So we find that in Tom's papers, uh, in David's papers, in Judith's papers. This is the creative process that you can see in manuscript form, but the fruits of their writing are here in this uh, beautiful, beautiful library. I'll just read one uh, part of a poem by Judith, um, which, is, which is dedicated to Tom. I won't read the whole thing because it's very, very long, but it's Mud Crab at Cambaros, which is uh, her very famous uh, collection, which won the Christopher Brennan Award. And uh, there's a copy of it there in the, in the display case just, uh, just behind you there. So Mudcrab at Gambaro's for Tom Shapcott. At Gambaro's we're fearfully pleased to light on land agents in threes and fours for lunch. They check us for affluence and return to their talk. Well, and so the big boy's coming back. Did he tie it up? Conducted, placed, we toast the midday feast. Morning's boom holds up, zooms into the order of Mudcrab. You pour, you tumble, ice, you borrow the, the bottle. I tipple and wonder how light's wine colour. The pallid, easy oysters pass, precursors, to hear, to hear it comes. The rosette biggin, platefuls of plate pincers, shanks, joints. Everyone neatly smashed, our own big boy heaped up high. We eat, ingenious and attentive, and land agents breathe heavily among tables through the room. Grave women come gathering the greaves, flanges, splinters. With force, we forced with hands bleeding, devotees of smooth encapsulated flesh and tingling white of beach sand at daybreak, staggering. The land boys push back their dog chairs. M mere stake, they diminish, sweating into the late lunch glare. We are mud crab and air. That's just the very beginning of what's a longer poem, but that's dedicated uh, to Tom. Now, just lastly, uh, uh, Zoe Rodriguez has sent through a message uh, that Steve has passed on to me. Uh, she can't be here, of course, because she's in New South Wales. Uh, Judith, um, as we know, passed away a couple of years ago. Um, collections that we have are really marvellous, marvellous letters, Tom, between Tom and, uh, and Judith, between David Maloof and Judith, and that complements a big bunch of letters we got from David Maloof himself too, from all sorts of amazing artists, writers and so on. Um, this is a message from uh, Zoe. How much mum would have loved to have been at this opening. How honoured she would have been to be so publicly acknowledged at a new cultural institution. Steve has sent me photos of the building as it has come to this point of formally opening today. I've watched the planting of the garden, the coming to get <coughs> together of the shelving. Uh, when Tom's daughter Kate mentioned that the Australian Cultural Library was being founded in Queensland and put mum in touch, mum didn't take long to get in touch and to decide she was for it. Tom, of course, was on board too. She would have loved that this is a truly community-directed place uh, for those who create or those who want to enjoy culture to come to. She'd have loved that the Australian Cultural Library is in Queensland, where she grew up, with a climate that was much closer to her liking than the city she made her long-term home in Melbourne. Some observations of the photos Steve has sent through. Um, the, comp the companion UQP collected in the display cabinet at the entry just over there um, are placed how she would have liked it. Her on the left, though that's not to say Tom is of any way a person to the right. 
Uh, and then with the striking cover of Mud Crab at Gambaro's, you have brought her huge talent for printmaking to the fore. It's her lino cut for which she negotiated with Dulux uh, for the paint uh, for the cover of this multi-award winning book. And then for the opening, the vase with roses. As a child, my grandmother Dora carefully tended a prized rose bush collection in her front garden. Mum was always a bit dismissive of it. Then later in life, in the large house that Mum and Tom shared in Melbourne, its largest predominantly secured to the house with their enormous library, Mum delighted in cultivating her own rose garden, guided by colour and name. She had almost no sense of smell. She would have congratulated Steve, Vanessa and the team fully if she were alive. She'd be delighted that books that excited and transported her to other places are going to be shared with the community, along with cultural events that she would have enjoyed. Bravo all, and thank you all, and love to my stepfather, Tom, uh, who I think is with you and built this library with mum. I'll be heading north when COVID allows me to visit. That's nice. So, uh, so now it just behoves me to ask uh, Tom to uh, make his way over to uh, this little section here where we will unveil the, the plaque. I'm sorry I cannot speak a stroke of my voice from afraid and it has gone. But all the best for this, though we, and to keep me ball. It's a pleasure, Tom. Pleasure. Words. Uh, it really good. I used to say go to a boy and my grandma from Ireland did just feel here and became the first railway. Well done. <laughs> My name is Thomas W. Shapcott. I'm going to read a poem called River Scene. I wrote this poem about a country that I know in near Ipswich, Queensland, when I was in my late teens. River Scene. Under the flood wrought bottle brush, the river shallowed and summered our shady picnic spot with shimmering lazy jewels and mirrors in light. And after our lunch, then we threw our silence, dancing onto the yellowed summer sand in patterns of daydreams. The afternoon early river, blandly liquid, liquid over the last of mountains become pebbles and sand in the current, sang us its lingering song, rippled and warned us, soon, soon. But we picked the smooth, rounded, yestertime mountains up and skipped the brief water with laughter and youth. The time was not awed. I was not prepared to know miracles then. The kingfishers arrived and surprised me. Their sudden snap and whip of air and sunset blue glass was sharp and feather soft and brief was brief. Too small the symbol tapped time of their flight through the unknowing trees. I only saw them between the seared and vanishing branches harp and glitter away. And only I saw, for the others still talked and stoned the shallows. That magic of kingfishers, did you see? Again, there again, and a shower of turquoise remoulded the trees. See them thrill the old known river. No, no, now they have passed. That were bright and sudden as the river is. But the others walked out on the tide-stained sandbank, and I followed them already forgetting the water song and the guiding birds.